Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. And it is great to be with you on this Easter Thursday uh, to share with you a little bit of a video uh, in place of the normal chapel. Uh, so again, it is a joyous Easter season, even if we're still remote from one another and not able to gather the way that we would normally do. Uh, I know a lot of people were missing uh, some of the uh, auxiliary things that go along with Easter, Easter egg hunts, Easter dinners with family, and, and God willing, next year, all of that will be back. But this year, I think we've learned that in spite of all the trappings of Easter that may have been taken away from us because of the COVID virus, the truth of Easter still rings out loud and clear, which is that Christ is risen, death has no more dominion over him, and because he is raised, we shall be raised as well. So there are a few things that I wanted to share with you this morning before I read you um, the gospel that's coming up for most of you this uh, Sunday. Uh, and again, most of you have connected with your churches by now so that you're uh, aware of, of that, that weekend pace and you're still able to participate with them in their services uh, over the airwaves or, or uh, in other forms that they provide. So for a lot of us this Sunday, we're gonna be hearing about Easter evening uh, from the rest of John chapter 20. And I'll get to that in a moment. But so the Easter season, um, it, you've probably heard this from your churches at one time or another, but the Easter season actually goes on for 50 days. All right, it's not just Easter Sunday and then it's all over. You might think that from going into the stores, but no, that's not the, the case. For the church, the Easter season continues all the way up to the day of Pentecost. Uh, and I'll leave that for next month when the next church gets to do these uh, video services. Right now, for us, we're still in the thick of Easter. We're only at the very beginning. And so we're still very much focused on all of those accounts of Jesus appearing to disciples to establish for them by many convincing proofs that he really is alive, that he really is with them, and that they have nothing to fear. And uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is to kind of trace through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all the different times that Jesus appears over those uh, 40 days before his ascension. Um, so obviously we know that on Easter morning, the first person to see Jesus raised was Mary Magdalene, as she was crying in the garden and she thought he was the gardener. And then uh, as the other women are going back to town, they bump into Jesus and Jesus says, do not be afraid, peace be with you. And, and then they excitedly bring the news to the rest of the apostles who think it's just nonsense. Um, we are told but sometime during that day, uh, Peter encounters Jesus. As it's referred to, but it's not uh, ever narrated for us. Uh, we get the story then of the two disciples on the way to the town of Emmaus, who have this traveling companion who joins them, asks them what they're talking about, and they spend probably what ends up being a couple of hours with him as he takes them through all the scriptures showing that the Messiah not only had to be rejected and crucified, but then on the third day he had to rise and they get to the inn and they ask the stranger to have the meal with them. And then as he's breaking bread, they recognize it's Jesus. And no sooner do they recognize him, he's gone. So they excitedly rush back to Jerusalem. And when they get back there, everyone else is in a hubbub because Peter had seen Jesus at some time. And then Jesus himself comes. And, and he shows them his hands and, and his side, and they rejoice to be in his presence. Uh, one of them wasn't there, that's Thomas. We'll hear about that when we get to uh, John 20 in, in a few moments. Um, so that's Easter day. Then we don't know what happens during the rest of that week, but then the next Sunday, Thomas is with the disciples and Jesus comes to them again. And this time Thomas does get to see Jesus and confesses that he is his Lord and God. And then it's time to go up to Galilee because Jesus said that he would meet them uh, back up there. And there is where we think um, a reference that St. Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 happens. He says that more than 500 believers saw Jesus at once. And we think that's the place where that happened because we know down in Jerusalem, there are only about 120 believers before the day of Pentecost. So if you're gonna have 500 all together, that probably has to be up in Galilee. So there's that. Then uh, there's a time when the disciples don't seem to know what to do with themselves. Peter decides to go back fishing. They fish all night, they don't catch anything. And then that morning, waiting on the shore is Jesus. They initially don't recognize him. He tells them to put the net on the other side of the boat. They catch a bunch of fish and then they go and have breakfast with Jesus. And, and then Jesus gives Peter a chance to be reconciled. You'll remember uh, Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. And now Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? 
And, and Peter says, well, of course, Lord, you know that I do. But Jesus asks him a second time and then a third time. And most people understand that this is Jesus' way of undoing Peter's denial, that, that Peter confesses his love for the Lord. And then uh, Jesus says, okay, go take care of my sheep, take care of my lambs. Um, so after that, up in Galilee, uh, there's a, yet another appearance. They're on a mountain up there with the 11 and that's where Jesus says, look, uh, all authority has been given to me now. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we think we change back down to Jerusalem uh, before the day of Jesus' ascension. And there's a little bit of a controversy about this. I, I don't want to get into that with you right now. Uh, but uh, at some point there... Jesus will open their minds so that they understand the scriptures and see that the Messiah, the Christ, had to be rejected, had to die, had to rise, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins had to be preached in his name, beginning in Jerusalem and going to all nations. And now the apostles were going to be witnesses of these things. And then the final after resurrection appearance of Jesus is when he takes them out to the Mount of Olives and blesses them and then goes up into the ascension. So there is a lot going on during those 40 days. And it, 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 these are these many convincing proofs that Luke says, that they know that he really is raised. No one has any doubt, but that Jesus lives and is active and is in the world. And for that reason, our lives have utterly been changed. Um, now, a couple of things that you'll notice in your churches, uh, depending on how they get the video set up, but, but here I've got these centralized for when we broadcast stuff. I, I still have our palm leaves on the altar because this reminds us that we're still greeting Jesus as King. Uh, he is still our risen Lord and he's the King who comes to us with deliverance. He's the King who comes to us to uh, share with us the spoils of his victory. Uh, he's the one who's come to bring us the righteousness of God. So we rejoice to have Jesus with us. And, and then you'll notice we've got the Paschal candle here. And uh, this big candle, the, the word Paschal, right, it comes to us from the Hebrew word Pesach, which uh, is, is for Passover. Uh, because we know that on Monday, Thursday, that's when the Passover meal was, and that's when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And, and so everything associated with Jesus' work was seen as a completion of the Passover, right? The lamb died in its blood, protected people from death. The, the pestilence passed over the places where they were. And then after the Passover of that pestilence, and the blood protecting the people from death, they were free from slavery in Egypt and they were able to go on to the promised land. And we understand with Jesus, our Passover lamb, his blood dying on the cross has protected us from sin and death. And now we are free through his resurrection to go on our way to the new and, and glorious life that God has prepared for us. So Paschal refers to Jesus, to the Passover lamb. And, and so this Paschal candle is a reminder to us of Jesus's life. And so we light the Paschal candle and keep it in a prominent place in the sanctuary during the uh, 40 days between Easter and Ascension. Now, after Ascension, the candle goes out and it gets moved oftentimes over by the baptismal font because now Jesus isn't visibly present with us the way he was during those 40 days after the resurrection. So you see the Paschal candle that you're reminded Jesus is visibly present for those 40 days after Easter. And then the other great thing about the Paschal candle is that it will be lighted whenever there's a baptism. Uh, and, and the custom is oftentimes to get a little tiny candle and light that off of the Paschal candle to hand that to the newly baptized to remind them that now that they are baptized into Christ, they have his light, they bear his light and the power of his resurrection and the joy of his life out into the world with them. Uh, the other time that we light the Paschal candle, interestingly enough, is at funerals. And, and the reason we do that is to remember that even though we are sad that a brother or sister in Jesus has fallen asleep and is dead, the light of Christ still burns for that person. They are with glory in Christ and they still have his light in them. And because they have his light, they have his life. And so their body may have to sleep in the grave for a while, but just as Jesus was raised up, they're gonna be raised up too. And then last but not least, right, you see Easter lilies all over everywhere. 
And the Easter lily is not just about um, you know a pretty flower that blooms this time of year, but uh, the, the fact that the, the flower itself kind of looks like a little trumpet. Uh, well, the tradition was da, 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 right. The trumpet sounds to announce the victory of Jesus. So as you see these things throughout the uh, the Easter season, let it continue to remind you of the uh, the great work that Jesus accomplished and the joy that we have in His victory over sin and death. So. As we get to John chapter 21, uh, I will read that for you and then uh, have a prayer for next Sunday. But I want to set it up for you a little bit and, and not really give you a homily afterwards. I know you got lots of stuff to do with remote learning. I've been uh, trying to help uh, one of our daughters with her remote learning assignments every day. And I realize that can be a lot of stuff to, to take care of. So I'll try to keep this uh, blissfully short, right? So. The upper room, uh, it is evening of that first Easter day. Everyone's huddled together. They're afraid that the authorities are gonna come looking for them as they get news that the tomb was empty and that uh, something is afoot with Jesus. Uh, but when he shows up, the first thing he says to them is peace be with you. And, and the word for peace uh, in, in the Old Testament and the New, it doesn't just have to do with everyone being calm and taking nice deep breaths and not being excited anymore, but it actually has to do with everything being in the proper order, everything working the way that it's supposed to as God designed it to. And because Jesus is now raised from the dead and sin has been taken care of once and for all, we now have peace with God. We now have peace with one another. We have peace in ourselves because things are being set back right. They're being made the way that they were supposed to be. Sin is being rolled back along with death so that Chapter 3 in the book of Genesis is kind of getting unwritten. Now, it's not completely unwritten yet, but the day is coming when that's not going to be a part of our lives anymore and we will be absolutely free. So he says, peace be with you. And, and then he, he says to them, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Uh, the English language uh, is a great language. It's a lot of fun. But one of the things the English language doesn't do is it doesn't make a distinction between you singular and you plural. Right Now, my lovely bride who comes from the South would say, well, oh no, we do have a, a, a plural for you. Y'all, right? Um, so I bring this up because Jesus says to the disciples, y'all are now being sent, right? So it's not just you individually, but all of you together are being sent out to be carriers of God's peace, God's joy, God's love, and the life of Christ who is raised from the dead. Right? Uh, in this era of the COVID virus, everyone's afraid of, of people who are not having symptoms, but who might be carrying the virus. And, and it's important to do good hygiene. It's important to be careful not to, to uh, unintentionally infect everyone. And we want to observe those safe uh, categories of, of social distancing and stuff like that. But we have a better word to speak in this Easter season, right? We are carriers of Christ's life. And we don't want to be asymptomatic of that. You want to show the symptoms of Christ's life as you carry that out into the world and carry his joy and his peace and his love. And, and so after he says that I'm sending y'all, right? He says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what energizes that, that faith and that work that we will do in his name. Now, Thomas isn't there that night. We don't know why he's missing from the number. All we know is that, that he's gone. And so... Jesus gets done visiting with them and the other 10 immediately go out and find Thomas and say, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is like, nah, I'm not having any of that, right? Um, we don't know why Thomas wouldn't believe them, right? He'd spent three years with them. He'd seen Jesus baptized. He'd seen the miracles. He'd gone through all the things that they went through. He knows that they're trustworthy, that they don't make stuff up. And yet he was not having any of it. Uh, sometimes you'll hear him referred to as doubting Thomas, but really uh, the original language says he was unbelieving Thomas, right? So he was just refusing flat out to have anything to do. And in fact, right, this Thursday, as we do chapel together, if we go back to that original Easter week, that was still a day where Thomas was still having none of it. Uh, we don't know how many times uh, his friends, the disciples, tried to explain to him, tried to convince him, tried to prove to him that Jesus was raised. Every day he was, no, 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 until finally the next Sunday, he's with them, and Jesus comes, and now he sees Jesus himself and, and says, my Lord and, and my God. Uh, he, he knew uh, that nothing was ever going to be the same, just as nothing is ever the same for us. So you have life in this living 
Jesus. And you have the words of Scripture so that even though you haven't seen Jesus, you are blessed in being able to believe Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit, and, and you have God saying, I'm sending you out into the world. And so we rejoice in that in this Easter season. So let's go ahead and hear from John chapter 20, and we're going to pick it up at verse 19 and read to the end of the chapter. John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and take your hand and put it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe Thomas answered him my Lord and my God Jesus said to him have you believed because you have seen blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Now there's one last thing I wanted to to say there. You may have noticed that Jesus showed them his hands where the nail holes were and showed them his side. And I've gotten questions over the years about that too. Now what's up with Jesus still bearing the marks of his crucifixion after his resurrection? Because we know and one of the things the Bible promises is that, you know, when we die and are raised, we're not raised with the injuries or the disease or the effects of age that we carried in this life. We are raised up whole and glorious and new and everything's functioning as it should. So why don't Jesus' wounds get fixed? And, and the short answer is because those are trophies. Those are the things that he displays to show the work that he did to accomplish our salvation. And so the disciples, rather than being grossed out by them, they're actually afraid when they first see Jesus because now he's back and they hadn't really behaved very well on Good Friday. And and maybe he was coming back to kind of settle accounts and, and, and give them what for. But when he shows them what he went through to save them, Suddenly they realized he is a merciful Savior. He is a loving Savior. And so they were glad when they saw him. And so for us, right, we see those wounds on Jesus resurrected, and they aren't to us things to be sad or ashamed about, but they are reminders to us of how great his love is for us, that this is what he did to accomplish our redemption. All right, let's close with prayer, and then I will let you get on with your day. Um, This is the prayer coming up for this Sunday. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, God bless the rest of your day and the rest of your week, and I will look forward to sharing another time of devotion with you next Thursday. Peace be with you all. Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.